welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Tom Olson. I am your meta host for the next three hours because we have hosts for the sessions and I'm the, I'm the rapper. Uh, no problem in computer science can't be solved by another layer of indirection, as they say. Um, so this is the plan for the 3D APIs BOF. Uh, we're going to start with a short uh, presentations by the chairs of the three 3D API working groups. Actually, we don't have Bartold for GL, so Neil Trevitt will stand in for him. Um, and that will be just what's happening with the working group today, um, uh, kind of minimal. Uh, most of our focus in this session will have, as I say, presentations from all three working groups, but the focus today is Vulcan. So after those uh, introductions, we'll have presentations from two highly skilled and experienced users of Vulcan, uh, Rolando Coloca Olivares and Axel Gneiting uh, from Epic and ID, respectively, talking about what it takes to put a major title uh, onto Vulcan. Uh, we're expecting that their presentations will fill the time slots and there won't be time for questions. But immediately after those presentations, we'll have a panel which they will participate on. So that panel will be both your chance to ask them questions. Uh, and to talk to uh, three other experts who will give short presentations on best practices in Vulcan. Uh, that'll be uh, for an hour. Uh, the focus is mainly for you to ask questions. If you don't have any, it's my job to uh, step in. So spare yourselves that agony and think of good, hostile, probing questions about Vulcan. We have another panel after that uh, on tools for the Vulcan ecosystem uh, that will be uh, uh, moderated by Karen Gavam, and then party time. Okay, so without further ado, it's a full schedule and we're already four minutes behind. Um, so uh, without further ado, please welcome Kronos President Neil Trevitt to present the update from the OpenGL Working Group. Hey everyone, I'm Virtual Barthold today. It's a big honor to be a Virtual Barthold. And four minutes behind me, so I have one, minus one minute to do this, so I'll, I'll be fast. The, we don't have a new OpenGL spec. Uh, it's not a lack of interest in OpenGL. The, the, the group has been mainly focused on Vulkan. Vulkan is where a lot of the focus is, but there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes uh, on conformance, and we do have a new uh, uh, extension uh, to bring uh, OpenGL into the Spear V uh, ecosystem, and this uh, was uh, re publicly released on Friday. Uh, I know a bunch of people are working on it. NVIDIA has a working driver that was released today. Um, so we can take the output of our open source uh, GLSL uh, compiler, and now we can ingest uh, Spear V into OpenGL. Which make, makes our Spear V ecosystem uh, slide get ever more busy and more interesting. So other new stuff that's happened recently with Spear-V is that the OpenCL C++ uh, support has been put into Spear-V 1.1. And now, of course, with the, the GL uh, extension, we can now begin to ingest Spear-V. So those of you who went to Tim Foley's presentation saying we should have C and C++ as um, shading languages, well, you know, the pieces are coming closer in, into place. Uh, some other interesting stuff going on out there in the ecosystem. It's not complete yet, but it is out there on GitHub. Please pitch in if you're interested. Uh, an HLSL to Spear V uh, converter without going through some contorted compiler multi-stage tra translation uh, as a straight HLSL to uh, Spear V, I think is going to be enabling people to have um, large uh, investments in HLSL, shader code, now you can start bringing it into OpenGL and Vulkan. Also, we're, we're getting close to having the Spear V validator. We all, already have the Spear V assembler, disassembler. The validator is getting very close. Well, again, everything is going to be uh, open sourced. OpenGL driver support. It's been a busy week. Mesa, in particular, has been going gangbusters. 12.1 released yesterday, now reaches pretty much OpenGL 4.5. So congratulations to Mesa. Glue, turns out, I had to do my slides because Glue 2.0 was released this morning after I'd sent my first draft to Tom. Um, so now we have uh, Glue 2.0 uh, released today. Lots of good support, EGL, uh, other stuff. So uh, the open source community really doing great. And of course, all the other hardware vendors, you know, increasing their support for OpenGL versions and uh, the extensions. Um, and thanks to Christoph for continuing to put together these charts. 
And I mentioned behind the scenes activity. We're actually investing quite heavily in making the OpenGL 4.5 conformance tests more robust, which in turn flows back into OpenGL ES. Uh, we did a new release of the tests in April. We're continuing to work. We'll do more releases, uh, continually upping the bar for what it means to be OpenGL uh, conformant. And uh, we, we're working, we have not doing it yet, but we're working to put as many of those tests into open source as we can, uh, similar as we have done with Vulkan. Of course, Doom, say no more, primary API, OpenGL. Of course, there's Vulkan coming too, but it's good that the, both of the open standard APIs uh, are being used uh, in, in Doom. And I'm, I can't believe this, but. Bartold swears it's true that the ninth edition of the OpenGL programming guide already includes OpenGL 4.5 with Spear V support, and you can order it on Amazon today. Last thing before I hand over, it's not OpenGL desktop, it's OpenGL safety critical. Um, those of you who might remember, we have OpenGL SC 1.0 was released um, back in 2005 for avionics. Uh, a subset of OpenGL ES 1.0. Well, now the automotive folks have got interested in the safety critical drivers, so we have OpenGL SC 2.0, which is a subset of ES 2, because car consoles need a little bit more eye candy than avionics displays. So that was released back in April. And I think looking forward, uh, there's going to be a bunch of the Kronos APIs that's going to need either consideration to safety critical certification as they're designed, or perhaps we'd even need to do safety critical versions like we did with uh, OpenGL, time will tell. Um, Vulkan is an interesting starting point. We're talking to a lot of the safety critical guys because it's a small driver, small driver size, that's a good starting point for those guys. And last thing, today we did a press release. Um, all the APIs in Kronos are gonna need safety critical considerations, and the considerations are apply across the different uh, API. Type. So rather than reinvent the wheel 15 times, we decided to set up a safety critical advisory panel that's going to create design guidelines for safety criticality. And it's going to be open, obviously, to Kronos members, but also inviting it, um, opening it up to industry experts uh, who can help us set this direction. There's an email there. You can go to the Kronos webpage. It's all up there. Uh, if you think and you would like to help us, set the direction for API design with safety criticality in mind. Now, please get in contact with us or you know, talk to us after the party. You know, buy me a beer and we'll let you on the panel. Okay, thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Tobias from Imagination. I'm the Open Chilis Chair. Um, those of you who have been coming here for a while have probably noticed I'm not Tom Olson. Um, he stepped down uh, in May, I believe. Uh, yes, May, I've got it on the slide deck, I should have looked. Um, I didn't usurp him, he basically decided he wanted to focus more on Vulkan because trying to chair two working groups of major graphics APIs kind of takes its toll and I can kind of understand that. So since then, I've, uh, been, I've taken over. Uh, Tom was an excellent chair for very nearly 10 years. He actually missed out on 10 years, I think semi-deliberately. Um, but he was great, and he saw through four OpenGLES releases. I didn't actually realize how many it had been. Um, so I think it, it's, uh, it's fair to say his contribution to graphics has been, especially mobile graphics, and the proliferation of graphics in the ecosystem has been quite immense over the years. So I'd actually like to uh, suggest we give him a round of applause for his contribution. Thank you, Tom. So the status of OpenGLES, um, there's not been a huge demand for a new version of OpenGLES just yet, um, so we're not announcing one now. Uh, we are keeping an eye on the market, and should such a need arise, we will certainly start working on one. What there has been a high demand for has actually been to make OpenGLES more robust, in the same way that uh, Neil was talking about working on the conformance tests, and we've been doing that too, but also on the specification, and we've had some push from the WebGL group, for instance, to work on at least OpenGLES 3 and uh, further specifications. So we've been kind of focusing on fixing um, the specs and enhancing them so that they're a bit more, uh, well, specific, I suppose. And there's more fixes on the way. We, we did the 3.2 API spec update last month after closing, I think, every bug we had on the 3.2 spec. It's not quite true anymore. We've got a few more that have cropped up, but we're certainly working to close them as quick as we can. With conformance, um, we've released the 3.2 conformances last year, um, and that was uh, 
mostly down to an integration of a lot of ES tests from the Android Open Source Project. This included a lot of OpenGLS 3.2 tests because by their nature they were based on a number of extensions including the Android extension pack. Uh, so a lot of that has come in and very much bolstered uh, what we have as our offering for OpenGLS CTS. Uh, part of actually getting that out the door was down to our new CTS lead, Alexander Gallatin from ARM, who is around here somewhere. Let's see if I can spot him. There he is, he's waving. So I, I feel like we would have struggled to actually get it out the door uh, w when we did without him, actually. So again, what the hell, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So he was elected at the same time I, w I was, um, and he's been doing a great job ever since. Uh, we now have uh, at least three companies that are now conformant. We've got NVIDIA Arm and I believe VeriSilicon just ticked over as well. And we've got a number of submissions from, I think, almost every other company pending, so they should be coming through very shortly. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, everyone. So I actually am Tom Olson. I'll, I'll get you for that later, Tobias. But thank you. Um, so, uh, and also starts with the annoying animations because I love PowerPoint animations. Um, last year, when I was at the BOF, I alleged that Vulcan 1.0 would be out before the end of 2015, didn't quite work that way. I should never say things like that. Uh, the reasons for it were not really technical. We had kind of done the design. It was frozen, but there were things that prevented us from releasing. Uh, fortunately, uh, we were able to spend that time uh, making the spec quality better and also working on ecosystem tools so that when we finally did release, we had more of a complete package and it was more ready for use. So not only specifications for uh, Vulcan itself, for Spear V, uh, et cetera, uh, but also GL slang was pretty mature, could generate uh, correct Spear V from HLSL programs. Uh, we had a significant SDK with validation, very important in Vulcan since the core API does no error checking. Uh, the conformance test was ready and we were able to accept uh, and demonstrate conformance. Uh, and then there were also uh, not from Kronos, but from our, uh, from our IHV members, uh, there were drivers, uh, which so things were ready to go the day of launch. Uh, we did something we've never done before in Kronos with this. Um, it started with a modest plan that, okay, we'll open source conformance. We ended up open sourcing the whole schmear. I gotta give credit to Christoph Riccio, who is in the room probably. Uh, for pushing us in that direction because he, he kept pounding the table and saying, you have to do it this way. He was right, uh, so we did it this way. Um, all of our software artifacts are under Apache 2.0 free use uh, at release, which means you can do anything with them pretty much. Uh, and as of now, there's also an Apache 2.0 con contribution license so we can take your pull requests, which we've been dying to do. Uh, spec is on uh, GitHub, but it's not under Apache because it's not source code, it's a weird thing, and we're still working on how to take contributions on that. Um, that's gonna happen as soon as we can do it. It's all under Kronos Group on GitHub. Um, so uh, the momentum and the rate at which Vulcan has penetrated the ecosystem and, and is becoming available is not like anything we've ever seen before in Kronos. We're kind of used to putting a spec out and maybe NVIDIA has drivers the day of launch and maybe they don't and it takes a while for it to become available. It's a slow process. That's not the way Vulcan is working. Um, the day of launch, we had a conformance certification from four uh, of the vendors and we're now up to seven uh, people with conformant drivers for, for their GPUs. In terms of hardware that you can actually buy that will run, uh, them. All of the desktop vendors have them. I don't know. There's kind of a complicated matrix of which GPU architectures cross which operating systems uh, can a given uh, vendor give you a driver for. Um, I think all or most of the GCN, Graham, I'm looking at you. Yeah, he's nodding. Uh, pretty much all the GCN uh, uh, GPUs have uh, Vulkan drivers. Uh, Intel, uh, Skylake supported everywhere. Uh, Skylake and Broadwell on Linux, and uh, Ian Romanek tells me that uh, before too long uh, they'll support uh, 
uh, it'll be production. So it's not a beta, it's, you know, you get a standard Linux drop, you will have uh, a driver, uh, Vulkan driver in it. Uh, NVIDIA for their three most recent architectures, or at least for these three <laughs> architectures, their standard consumer driver drop has Vulkan in it. So if you update your driver, you've got it. On the mobile side, of course, we don't have installable drivers, typically. That we, for some platforms we do, but generally it's rare. Uh, so um, it's going to be slower that we'll see the rollout happen. Uh, but uh, Galaxy S7 and uh, NVIDIA Shield, Shield TV, uh, support Vulkan under Android M. And Google, of course, has announced that Android N will support uh, Vulkan. So if you are a developer and you have access to the developer preview, there's a couple of Nexus devices and the Pixel C have drivers in the current developer preview build. Of course, Android N will go live uh, in the not too distant future. And at that point, you will see Vulkan drivers all over the place. So that's exciting. In terms of platforms, again, there's a little bit of a complicated matrix for the desktop, but most of the desktop vendors are supporting 7, 8, and 10. On Linux, Android, of course, uh, and as I said, uh, uh, for Intel, the Mesa driver will be standard. It's already in sort of aggressive builds for Red Hat uh, and Ubuntu, I believe, and then and SteamOS. Uh, the situation on iOS, of course, they don't, and macOS, they don't allow installing third-party drivers. Um, but there is a solution, and Bill's going to talk about that during the tools panel, so I won't. Uh, but it is possible, and we can show you a demo during the party of uh, Vulkan applications running on macOS or iOS. Working down the ecosystem here, so we started with uh, hardware and we're working to software. Um, there's lots of work going on with high-tech engines. Uh, Valve was demonstrating Dota 2 before the API was even frozen uh, back at GDC a year ago. Uh, the day of launch, uh, uh, Crow Team had a build of Talus principle that worked uh, on Vulkan. And more recently, we've seen real high-end commercial stuff. Uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, uh, right after I sit down, we have uh, Rolando and... Uh, and Axel will be talking about the ports of, uh, uh, to Unreal, of Unreal 4 and id Tech 6 with applications running on them. I don't know the exact status as far as how far into production these things are, uh, but they'll be able to clarify that for you. Um, and then, so, but it doesn't end, of course, with the game engine guys. There's a huge community out there. And it's been really interesting to me uh, to see what's going on. I went Monday night to GitHub and I typed Valve into the top level, sorry, Vulkan, into the top level uh, search engine. And there are 431 projects on uh, GitHub that have some level of Vulkan involvement. Maybe that means they have a, a comment in there that says Vulkan sucks, so I'm using DX12. <laughs> I don't actually know that. <laughs> I didn't look at them all, but I did look at quite a lot. I didn't find any uh, that said that. That's just my paranoid nightmares creeping up. I found things like lots of people are adding Vulkan backends to existing uh, projects, quite cool projects, uh, and so that's cool. Um, there are some really awesome tools out there, in particular RenderDoc, if you haven't checked it out, now has Vulkan support, and that is something you should absolutely mess with. And there's a lot of people doing cool demos and tut tutorials. We're particular fans of, this is the, the one we've most recently fallen in love with, uh, is Alexander Overvoudes. Uh, Vulkan tutorial, check that one out too. And add your own. Um, among the 431 projects on uh, uh, GitHub are six or so that Kronos actually owns. Uh, one of those is the conformance test. We had conformance 100 the day of launch, uh, but we've been working hard since to expand it, or rather the, the team has. Uh, is Puri in the audience? Yeah, there he is. That's, the, that's our... Uh, uh, conformance test czar. Um, so uh, the latest release is not quite out, but it is frozen. Uh, it's in feature freeze and final soak. It has 28,000 new test cases in it compared to 1.00. Uh, the coverage is much better. Uh, we're grateful to everyone who participated, but particularly to Samsung, Intel, and Google, who did the lion's share of the work. Um, the SDK, that's also on GitHub, and the, the validation layers. 
Um, they're, they're on roughly a monthly cadence, slightly faster than monthly. Um, validation, as I said, is the thing without which you can't write Vulkan code. Uh, our validation layers are not perfect, but the coverage is growing steadily. Uh, there's coverage for everything. Uh, the stats here tell you something of the level of activity uh, that's happening. And you'll hear more about that during the tools panel uh, at uh, four, five o'clock. Uh, GL Slang, um, lots of things happening on GL Slang. Uh, and huge shout out to John Kasenich, who's the, the tech lead for that. But I particularly wanted to highlight that there's a team that is working on adding HLSL support. It's always been a huge problem that people, you have to run cross-platform. And many people write their shaders, have their pipelines in HLSL. Um, so being able to go straight to Spear V from that will be awesome. There are lots of issues. The interface for DX12 and for Vulkan are slightly different. You can track the progress. There's a great little checklist uh, with checks next to the knocked off items on issue 362 in the GL Slang project. And finally, a couple of our members, uh, Kronos members, have added, uh, have taken open source projects that they were working on on GitHub on their own and brought them inside the, the Kronos umbrella. Um, the Spear V cross tool is, is nice. You'll hear again about that during the tools panel. I wanted to highlight uh, uh, Vulkan HPP, which is a project developed by two guys in NVIDIA. Is Andreas in the room? There's Andreas. Say hi. Um, uh, so eight, Vulkan HPP is a header-only wrapper for Vulkan. So instead of level zero, which is like extern C include Vulkan.h. Uh, you don't want to do that. You can do much better. Vulkan HPP is not an official Kronos standard, but it's something we like very much. We've consulted with Andreas and Marcus on the design of it. We think it's a great place to start. And if you want to use Vulkan from, uh, uh, from C++, we recommend it. Um, and I don't have time to talk about it. Andreas is here. I hope he's going to be here for the party. You can, uh, he's nodding, good. So if you want to know more about that, what it does and what it doesn't do, uh, you can uh, uh, talk to him. And also, of course, the project is there. It's open source. If it doesn't do quite what you want, mess with it, make pull requests, et cetera. Um, what the working group has been doing, uh, we're doing lots of uh, uh, 1.0 spec maintenance. There are lots of little things and a couple of big things. Um, I do want to say, I'm an old guy, right? I don't get this modern open source stuff. And when we originally said, hey, let's put the spec source on GitHub, I was a little skeptical and nervous about it. Turned out to be the best idea ever. It's been totally awesome. We've had huge numbers of very smart people reading the spec, pointing out uh, not only typos, but logical errors, places where we said this and um when we meant that one, uh, and even places where there's a corner case in the spec that we didn't say what's supposed to happen. Um, I'm particularly proud of uh, the fact we've had, as you can see, there's 185 public issues that we've closed. A lot of them are still open, and those are the hard ones. We do spend 50% of our working time on public issues. That's our commitment to you to try to be responsive. If we're not as responsive as you'd like, I'm sorry. We're doing the best we can. Please keep submitting issues. Uh, we're doing pretty much an update every week with the closed issues in it. Um, so please know that we are listening and paying attention. That was 50% of our time. The other 50% of our time is going into Vulcan Next. Um, so we are actively working on defining the core spec and also on some extensions which fill gaps that we have noticed or that people have pointed out. Um, I can't commit to a schedule. I've learned my lesson. Uh, but we're working on it steadily, and you should see stuff uh, coming out. You definitely will see it. We have identified our top priorities. These are some of them. Uh, you can use multiple GPUs in Vulkan today, but not very well. Like you can't, for example, render to a texture with one GPU and then consume it in another GPU. Uh, we're working on making that better. Lots of things for VR support. That includes multi-view, also synchronization and sharing and, and stuff like that, uh, cross-API and cross-process stuff. Subgroup, uh, these are all things that are missing today in Vulkan. Subgroup instructions were recently added to Spear V, and we're going to expose those. Uh, some improvements to render pass, and very important, a, uh, a tightening up the memory model, which right now is not very well specified. 
So um, we think we've got good momentum. We think we're making good progress and we like our roadmap. Uh, we really need your help. If we've learned anything from 20 years of OpenGL, it's that it's not the spec that is awesome, it's the community that makes it awesome. And, and we hope that will continue uh, and we need it to continue in order for Vulkan uh, to be successful. So if you uh, think that the idea of an open sort of community controlled cross-platform high performance graphics API is a good idea, you can make it happen. Uh, you can start by using Vulkan if you aren't uh, and give us feedback on it. Uh, you can contribute to the ecosystem. As I said, we've worked very hard to make that as easy as we can. Uh, we, now I have to say, Kronos, th the combined members of Kronos have lots of money, but Kronos has almost none. Uh, so there isn't a whole lot that Kronos can do by itself. We do plan to fund at least a little bit of this. There's wonderful tutorial stuff happening, but we'd like to make it a little better. We will issue RFQs for small projects, like in the order of a couple of guys for a couple of months, uh, to do tutorial improvements. Watch for those. I think you can subscribe uh, to the news feed on the chronos.org, uh, and you'll, you'll see those come out. Um, and help us promote the API. Uh, you can blog about it. You can, as I say, ship great applications for it. Uh, one thing, we do have an official marketing department. Most people hate their marketing departments. We love ours. Kathleen is awesome. She's in the back of the room, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, one thing we're going to try to do is host uh, a uh, collection of videos of cool Vulcan content. Uh, we would love to promote that. If you are interested in contributing something or are willing to uh, send an email to marketing at chronos.org, that means Kathleen, uh, and, uh, and we'll take you up on that. So that's where we are. No time for questions because it's time to please welcome to the stage Rolando Caloca Olivares, who did the uh, uh, epic, the Vulcan port of UE4. Hello, uh, I'm Rolando Caloca. So basically, I'm going to talk about how we ported Unreal Engine to Vulcan and some stuff about the ProStar demo. Um, well, this is the actual starting slide. So a short intro is we're going to talk about a little bit, very quickly, how uh, the RHI architecture works, uh, how the ProStar demo worked, how we had that initial RHI working, uh, how it works right now, and what are our challenges and future plans. So what is the RHI? The RHI is basically the render hardware interface. It's our API or our Vulkan or our D3D. Uh, it's the way we talk to each of the graphics APIs. So originally, uh, UE4 had an architecture where the game thread, there was a game thread and a render thread. Um, the game thread would enqueue command for the render thread, and then the render thread would generate, would basically call the driver, uh, in this case, Vulkan. Uh, as we moved on, we added a new thread called the RHI thread. So now the game thread enqueues commands into the render thread as before, but the render thread instead enqueues commands for the RHI threads, and then the RHI thread translates those commands into Vulkan commands, and then the driver uh, executes them. This allows us to go parallel uh, on different stages. So we could be generating commands in the render uh, in parallel, and then we could be translating commands in the RHI in parallel. So why do we want to use the RHI thread and not directly generate the commands and go parallel at, in the render? Uh, this makes it a little bit easier for us to um, uh, bring up new RHIs up and running. Uh, and we noticed there was a CPU improvement by just de decoupling the data um, you know, working on the render code and data space and then the RHI or the Vulkan or D3D um, memory space. Uh, just by detaching them, we got between 5 and 10% CPU performance. Why do we want to use Vulkan? Uh, well, it's cross-platform, high performance. It's predictable. Um, sometimes on other drivers, uh, you're running on PC, you run a game, you get a hitch in one of the draw calls, you run it again, the hitch is gone on the same draw call. Um, so we have now control over that. We have control over memory allocations, uh, over aliasing of memory. Uh, and on GPU performance especially, we can now say when we want to flush a cache or not. Uh, plus it's very similar to D312 and Metal. So what is the ProStar demo? Uh, this was a collaboration between Epic, Samsung, Qualcomm, and Confetti. Uh, it was a tech demo to showcase the Samsung S7 GPU and also the Vulkan API on mobile. It was also a Trojan horse to get uh, push people to actually uh, adopt Vulkan. Uh, here's a little video of what the demo looked like, and it was all real time. Um. Basically, 
have reanimated stuff like the rocks we pulled them from the device into the central rock. So here you would click on uh, the planets and on the center rock and start making it go faster and faster and faster. running on a uh, Samsung S7 uh, and it was also running uh, on PC uh, with our mobile render. So the, our very first version of Vulkan, so our Hello World Vulkan basically, um, wasn't very great, but it was you know, enough to start uh, playing with the API. So originally we had uh, one big pool for the scripter sets. Uh, we just had 32,000 entries and after a while we'll run out. We had problems with synchronizations. Um, any updates to buffer and textures, we were doing in-place lock on lock or map on map. Um, and this didn't work on some drivers because um, some GPUs can't read linear textures and you can only map linear textures. Uh, we also have problems for, or basically an optimization for correctness where every, every time after every time we unmapped, we would submit the command buffer and wait for it. Um, so basically the, so the GPU would be done, uh, would have the memory uh, uploaded. Uh, this ended up stalling the loading because the, CPU would load the memory, then we would kick the command buffer, wait for the GPU to be done, continue, continue the CPU, and over and over and over, and then we had a lot of assets. So obviously this wasn't good. We also had problems with haste, uh, crazy hitching, but I'll talk a little bit more how we mitigated that in a bit. And there was no RHI thread. We had just the rendering thread I described, generating directly Vulkan commands. Uh, we were barely hitting 20 on the CPU frame frames. So then we went in, came in and started doing optimizations before shipping the demo. Uh, basically profiling the CPU, uh, hierarchical counters, and basically every bottleneck we found do uh, optimizations. For example, we found the scripter sets writes were, were being generated every update, so we would cache those. Uh, we used to have a big pool of one descriptor sets and then partition the vertex and the pixel. Uh, so we would be setting the whole thing, but this would cause some drivers to go through the slow path. So instead we split it into one set for vertex, one for pixel. Uh, removed a lot of dynamic object allocations, et cetera, you know, over and over. Uh, and then finally we got it to 30, uh, ready for the, um, for the demo. Uh, however, you know, we didn't, we're not clear, but we weren't clear on validation back then. Uh, you know, but we had to ship the demo. So Chuck Nari said it's good, so ship it. <laughs> so after the demo that you saw, um, we decided to basically make it a shippable full uh, API for all, any title. So we just said, okay, let's just make up a small list. I mean, probably the list is small enough, but it didn't. So the first thing to do is, okay, let's clean up. Let's remove all the hacks that we have, because um, you, know, you have to clean your technical debt. Um, we have to make it robust and fault tolerant. Uh, it has to support separate RHI thread. That way we can go parallel on both render and um, RHI. And we have to pass all the validation layer warnings. Um, some warnings might be acceptable. For example, the warning that says you are writing to a disabled attachment in the pixel shader, we'll fix it at some point. Um, it's not crucial, you know, more than a, you're using a deleted sampler kind of warning or error. Those ones you do have to fix. Uh, we also want feature parity with D312 on metal. Uh, and we basically want it to be all fully featured so we can run the kite demo uh, and basically also run Paragon. And finally, our last objective is to get full editor running. Once that's done, then, then that, that, once that works, then pretty much done with the RHI. So what's the state of today's Vulkan RHI that you can get on GitHub? So today we, we do have the RHI thread separately, translating the commands, so we have the separate thread. We have the full mobile renderer working. 
uh, we have some good perf. Um, we still have some optimizations to do, like uh, optimizing how we describe the descriptor set layouts. We're passing most of the validation. Uh, we're missing a bunch of image layout. Um, so we still, I will talk about that also. Um, and right now we're working on getting the shader model four or the fair render working, uh, and then shader model five, which includes compute. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit on detail on these things that uh, might be interesting for you if you're doing your port uh, or your Vulkan uh, application. So starting with the command buffers, every RHI thread has a context, uh, and that one owns a command buffer manager. Uh, every command buffer manager has a list of persistent command buffers. Persistent meaning we don't delete them uh, over the frame or uh, we just reuse them in a pool. Uh, every command buffer manager has an active and an upload command buffer. So it has to have two because you can't upload memory in the middle of a render pass. So you have to have the active one and then uploading in the, doing your uploads in the upload command buffer and then synchronizing uh, which one gets executed first. Every command buffer has a fence and a counter. Uh, the counter basically tracks how many times the fence has been hit when you submit the command buffer. So we periodically query the fence, uh, and once it's signaled, then we uh, increment the counter and reset the fence. Uh, every command buffer basically knows its state. Uh, so this list of states, uh, it's a little bit better shown here. Um, commands can only happen between inside the, the red and the orange or yellow um, boxes. So inside begin and inside render pass. Uh, after we're done, we call end and then we submit the command buffer. Once the fence is signaled, we mark it as ready for begin. So resources in Vulkan, we treat buffer images, fences, and semaphores, and in general memory, uh, using a, like a, a resource um, paradigm. So allocating a resource means you acquire one from its pool. Could be a reused one, could be the brand new one. When you release a resource, uh, it means you're not using, the application is done with it, so it's up to the RHI to do what it wants with it, uh, either deleting it or um, handling. As far as the, the renderer is, is concerned, there's nothing else, uh, it doesn't own it anymore. And finally, destroying a resource means actually physically calling VK destroy on it. So with the general pattern or algorithm for managers that we have, uh, we have a used list, a pending free list, and a free list. So when we allocate a resource from the renderer, we try to find it on the free list. Uh, if there's one, well, cool. We just put it on the use list and then um, return that one. Otherwise, we'll make a new one and then add it to the use list. When the renderer says, I'm done with this resource, we move it from the use list to the pending free list, and we store the fence counter and the command buffer. That way, uh, so then periodically, uh, that's once per frame or every command buffer submit, we go through the free list. Uh, and anything that's not being used for end frames, we just destroy it. We call VK destroy on it. Um, we also go through the pending free list and we check that counter that we stored when we released it and convert to the current command buffer's counter, um, fence counter, and then once it's uh, past that counter, then we can move it to the free list. Uh, other utilities we have, we have a buffer suballocation manager, uh, so basically we allocate as few buffers as possible, a few VK buffers as possible, uh, and this thing just manages the subranges uh, so we can reuse the memory and not have to give it back to, uh, to the OS. Uh, we have a fence manager that basically is the one we mentioned that goes and tracks, uh, updates the fence states. Uh, we have a temporary frame allocator. Uh, that one is basically a tape allocator, so it just allocates, grows, 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 and then once uh, every frame or when it's done with it, then it just resets back. Uh, we use this to push temporary data um, or like uniform buffers or push constant data, something like that. And we have a deferred deletion queue. The high level just calls, this basically has a smart pointer uh, of a texture and then just sets it to null, so it causes like a deletion. So then the destructor of that one goes and enqueues the Vulkan object or the Vulkan, uh, our Vulkan RHI object into the queue. And that one will manage it, um, passing it to, the, to its own resource manager. So this is a, an interesting bit we recently uh, fell into. So we have a function on the RHI called get back buffer. Um, and this is related to how the presentation system works. Um, so we would th you would have thought this was a good place to call VK acquire next image. But for us, this is called inside and outside the begin viewport and end viewport, and end viewports where we do the present. Uh, it's called multiple times, and it's called on both the render and the RHI threads. So this means the RHI thread will have to talk to the rendering thread back, which we don't want, because the pattern is game to render to RHI to Vulkan. Um, so one solution would be to have two back buffers, but then still we would have to synchronize. Um, and we have to synchronize also with the, how the queues work and the presentation. So instead, what we did is uh, we make a dummy back buffer texture. 
Oh, this got messed up. Uh, well, the basically the render uh, calls the get back buffer function. Uh, if it doesn't have one stored, it will allocate a new one and insert an RHI command. Um, so the RHI command will actually call acquire next image. Um, if it has one, it will just basically return the, the one that it had already allocated. And then at some point later in the frame, uh, the renderer says advance the back buffer. So it just sets that pointer to null. And meanwhile, the RHI thread, whenever you call get back buffer, it will just return the, the back buffer using that index, the image using that index that it acquired. So how does uh, state setting uh, on the renderer work in Vulkan? Uh, on UE4, we have the high level renderer just calls set bound shader state, which sets the shaders, then sets depth stencil state, for example, couple of draw calls, and then set raster as a state, and then draw. Um, this pattern was good for D3D11, um, but you know, for the new APIs, this is kind of uh, problematic. So the way right now we are working, um, handling this case, uh, when we call set bound shader state, each bound shader state has its own, there's one per each thread, uh, and that has its own set of state flags. So when you first set it, it's set all to dirty. Uh, then in this case, we, we have a call to set depth stencil state, um, and that one set is, sets its flags as dirty for just that part also. They get the first draw call, draw call A. Uh, every draw call has a prepared draw function. That function, uh, what it does is goes and tries to find a pipeline set object with those matching flags in the cache, or if it's not there, we'll create it. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about how this works in a bit. Um, but once it finds it, either by creating it or getting it from the cache, uh, it will mark the state flags as no longer dirty. Then we call VK command draw. So then the next draw call comes, uh, and there's nothing changed between, so prepare draw sees that it's not dirty, uh, and it doesn't do anything, pretty much. Then we call VK command draw. Then we get the next state change, set rasterize state, and we mark the state there, the flags as dirty, and it's the same pattern again on the next draw call. We check prepare draw, we try to find a PSO with those flag bits, uh, or create, uh, mark them as not dirty anymore, and then call draw. So for resource setting in the, um, in the engine, it's a similar pattern. We have set bound shader state, couple draw calls, then we switch a texture, and then we draw again. So what's happening under the hood is same thing. On set bound shader state, we have a list of the scripters, write list, uh, so we mark that list as dirty. And the first draw call, prepare draw, will set the, the write list, we'll check if it's dirty. If it is, then we'd allocate a new set of the scripter sets from the pool, update and bind it. Uh, and then we'll mark this write list as not dirty. Call VK command draw. Then the next draw call, uh, prepare draw does the same thing. It checks if the write list is dirty. It's not in this case, so it will just uh, not do anything and then call VK command draw. Then we switch a texture. So it goes and updates the write list and sets it to dirty. Uh, and we get the third draw call, which calls prepare draw again. The write list is dirty. Uh, allocate a new set of the scripper sets, update them, and bind. Uh, if it's not dirty, then, uh, and marks it as not dirty, and then we call draw again. So I mentioned the problems with layouts, that we're not passing validation yet. This is a problem because of render passes. Uh, UE4 basically doesn't have a concept of render passes. You could have a, the high level doing something like this, which is calling set render target, draw, then resolving the MSA buffer, then set render target, then draw, then triggering some compute, then draw, then set render target, then draw. So this is probably a problem all older uh, engines or non-modern engines have. Um, so it is a problem for us because we don't have a good way of tracking transitions. The only way to track them would be to actually have them inside the RHI. Uh, but then we have to deal with the render is multi-threaded and then the render can also switch to compute workloads uh, to compute. Uh, so we wouldn't know, probably we don't know the previous state basically. Um, so what we did is we started exposing resource transitions in the RHI but we still don't have enough info. We did this for all other platforms. Um, so the high level does have changing resource, transi transitioning a resource, but it's only one way. So it doesn't have no information of the previous state. So we're still researching how we want to expose this uh, on the engine because it's a big change and we don't want to break licenses. <laughs> uh, side note of how we do shaders. Um, shaders are written in HLSL. They are called USF files. Um, we have a cross compiler in the engine that we've been using for a while. That's how we generate metal and GLSL. It's based off the Mesa, Mesa IR. Uh, and then we convert to SpearV using the GLSL slang lib from the SDK. We just link with it. Um, we might end up having a direct SpearV backend for the cross compiler, but it depends how, um, how extensions and all that comes from. 
So the next big thing is PSOs, everybody's favorite thing. Um, so you, Unreal compiles the shaders conservatively. So you declare a vertex shader, you declare a pixel shader, a geometry shader, and then at runtime, we match them. Um, so any combination, or you know, a lot of combinations can be done at runtime. Uh, for example, you can have a blueprint dynamically spawning a new point light, so the shader has to be compiled, and we don't know the, com the permutation of vertex with pixel. Uh, that makes it very hard for us to pre-compile all combinations. So we have to create them at runtime, uh, and this is why we have hitches uh, on the demo. So as a side note, we have shader pipelines already. Uh, this is basically defining at compile time the vertex and the pixel combination, but it's not done for all passes. It's only done for the depth and the velocity passes. Uh, did, we did this because it allows us at compile time, at shader compile time, to um, get, have both sets, the vertex and the pixel, and remove the unused interpolators, as this is very useful on some architectures um, that have these bottlenecks. So our original plan was to take shader pipelines and gr grow those into um, PSOs, but we still need to know all the rest of the state, for example, the render target formats, uh, the render targets format, um, the vertex layout, things like that. So instead, so for ProStar, we were hitching at the beginning. Uh, the first run through was hitching a lot, and it was not very great because we're making a lot of PSOs. And as I mentioned, we couldn't use the shader pipelines because we hadn't done the base pass, which is the one that has hundreds of shaders. Um, so what we ended up doing is we made a pipeline cache. So the way this cache works is every time we have a new PSO, um, which we, have a, we make a hash of the render stage, the, the format, uh, the render target format, the vertex layout, and we a CRC of the microcode. Then we store those into, into the global cache, and at some point when you're done with your demo or your game, you play through, you, you type a, a console command and that saves it to disk. Uh, at load time, we always try to load that if it's there. So there's basically two caches of PSOs. This is related to how I mentioned the, um, we change state on the render. There's a local cache inside the boundary state, and there's a global one. If, uh, if, we have the, if we're asking for a PSO with a particular hash inside the local one uh, at render time, we just return that. Uh, otherwise, if it's not there, then we check the global cache. If it's there, then we copy it to the local cache and then return. Uh, if, if it's not in either, then we'd create a new PSO and add it to the, blo the global and the local caches. Uh, at, in the end, we ended up uh, pitch free on the final demo. And this is for both. Uh, this, all this is common to Android and PC, uh, the same code. So the issues with the PSO uh, cache is that the, we will be changing shaders all the time, so the cache is getting validated. Uh, as anytime you move the material around or you added something to the material, the microcode is different again, so the, the cache is invalidated for that bound shader state. Uh, it doesn't cache all the cases. Um, and then licensees, some studios don't have the resources or the manpower to have QA going through the game, or the game is very dynamic, um, so the cache ends up getting huge, or they just don't have the time to go through it. Uh, so we actually need a better solution. So this is an active area of investigation. We're investigating three different plans right now. Um, one of them is to prototype real PSO support, basically adding the shader pipelines, uh, sorry, the pipeline state objects in the RHI. Uh, we're still researching the impact of the code base of that. The other plan is making a general PSO when we load the material using some common state and then use the pipeline create derivative bit to get faster compiles. Because um, we know some of the state, but just not all. And the third plan is on the render thread, when we create a PSO, we want to create it with the unoptimized flag. Uh, basically, the disable optimization bit, uh, so that will so the renderer will get the set bound shader state, triggers the compilation, and then the RHA thread when it starts executing, it, hopefully by then the latency is enough that it's done. Uh, at the same time, we we'll start compiling uh, the optimized version, the one without this flag, um, and then we we'll replace it. So all these three plans are orthogonal, and the final solution is probably going to make a be a mix of all of them. Uh, just finally, wanted to mention about tools. You're only as good as your tools. Uh, we found this very early, um, and please use the validation layers. We had a session yesterday where we talked a little bit how we use them on UE4. Uh, it's probably available on YouTube, or you, know, you can find it probably, um, so take a look at that. And special shout out to RenderDoc. It's the, the best tool ever. Um, that's what we use for tracking any GPU problems, any rendering problems. Uh, for We use it a lot on UE4, uh, not just for Vulkan, but for D3.12 and 11 and OpenGL. Uh, D3.12 support, I think, is coming. And I wanted to point out the Sasha Williams uh, web blog, po uh, blog post about how to use debug markers, uh, how to name objects, because it's very, very useful. So in closing, we are still also investigating. We're not done with the RSHI, as I mentioned. Uh, we want to investigate adding render subpasses for post-processing. 
We want to add support for push constants. Uh, we want to greatly rework how we do the script per set layouts. Uh, also, the drivers are really good right now, but you'll still uh, eventually run into a blue screen. So be sure to report bugs to the, your IHVs uh, with repo steps and um, as much information as you can. Uh, and I would recommend to have a, multiple cards for different vendors. That way you can find out uh, if a problem is on the driver or if it's actually a problem on your code. Because uh, sometimes even after the validation passes, you know, you still get a, a driver bug. So thanks, and I uh, just wanted to thank uh, the rendering team, the core rendering team, the mobile rendering team, all the rendering teams ever, uh, the platform team, Samsung, Qualcomm, and Confetti. Uh, and you can ask me any questions in Twitter uh, if you don't find me around or anything. Thank you. Uh, I can take some questions, I guess. Went a little fast, I speak a little fast. They don't, if they don't have one, I do. Uh, this, the, pipe, the PSO cache that you built, is this, this is completely different from the Vulkan built-in? Yes, it's a, our okay, own generic so, PSO cache. Okay. So we so, can use that on multiple platforms. Okay, so, so either now or during the panel, we should talk about why the Vulkan PSO cache is broken. Okay. Or <laughs> do you want to talk about it now? Or? Uh, later. Later, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anyone else have questions for Rolando? Okay, okay. Uh, let's bring up Axel then. Thank you. Thank you. So this is basically the same talk, but for Doom. Uh, my name is Axel Kneiting, and I work for it Software. Um, the agenda for the talk will be, I'm gonna show a short demo video uh, of the game running with Vulkan and give a short ATX6 overview. Then I'm gonna go into the technical details of the port, and at the end, I'm gonna uh, talk about our results and what we want to do with Vulkan in the future. So next up is uh, the demo video. It's a short gameplay sequence running uh, Vulkan. <laughs> As you can see, runs very well. So our ATTACK 6 uh, is currently running on PC with OpenShell, and now with Vulkan as well. We also have uh, PS4 and Xbox One support, and it runs Doom and will also power uh, future IT software titles. And uh, the sign goal for the engine is it needs to be 60 hertz or more. And our shader syntax in the engine is similar to HLSL and then we translate that to PSSL, HLSL, and GLSL at build time. Uh, on the CPU side, what's new with ATTACK 6 is we actually already had parallel command buffer generation on the consoles, which means we split up the GPU frame into different contexts that we fill on the GPU. So each of those contexts has a command buffer and the associated state with it, and each uh, of those contexts get filled by multiple jobs which are serial on the job system. So, and the last job then submits the uh, command buffers to the GPU. We do the same work in OpenShell, but we still use a traditional render thread because uh, we can't run uh, parallel jobs there. But still, some of the non-graphic stuff is running in jobs. Uh, on the GPU, we have uh, clustered forward shading, but some of the stuff is deferred. And what's good about the engine is we use almost the same shader for all of the uh, world geometry. Also, it mainly uses the same set of textures because we still use um, some sort of mega texture system. So we actually have very few state changes. Uh, after that, the engine does extensive post-process like depth of field, temporal AA, 
and SSDO, etc. And we leverage a lot of asynchronous compute. On the consoles, we do DXT encode for our virtual textures. We run GPU particles in async compute, and we run the post-processing also in async compute. So porting to Vulkan, uh, we started early, two th uh, we started uh, 2015 with an early version. Uh, we already wrote most of the Vulkan backend code, got uh, some first triangle rendering, minus some bugs. Uh, this was an early NVIDIA driver. Then we had to do some console work, so we were sidetracked. So we had to pick it up in March 2016 again. And at game launch, it actually was almost running. We did this demo with NVIDIA on a GTX uh, 1080 launch, uh, so that was already running. Uh, RenderDoc helped a lot. So again, use that, it's really awesome. And uh, why was it delayed for two months? It was small issues with the drivers. So we, it was back and forth, uh, forth with uh, both IHVs. And uh, the swap chain was also surprisingly hard to get right. Um, what, what was also an issue was that the validation layers were actually quite unreliable back then. We had lots of false warnings, especially with multiple command buffers and image layouts. So we actually had to write our own validation stuff. Um, but now, actually, the validation layers are quite good. I don't think we have any more false positives. So I guess you could just use those. But it's still good to have some own validation stuff because it might be easier for debugging. Uh, for the shaders, we already had a GLS cell translator, obviously, for OpenGL. But in OpenGL, we were still doing binding by name, so with uh, shader reflection. And Wilkin requires you to do binding IDs, so we had to retrofit this into our GLS cell translator. And on AMD, we actually use extensions. So for all the shaders we have in the engine, we actually create another variant for AMD, which is using uh, AMD shader ballot for uh, scalar optimization. Uh, Jean and Tiago were talking about that on Monday in the ITEC 666 uh, talk. If you have missed that, you should check it out. It's really interesting. And we also use AMD GCN shader. We can, for example, accelerate some cube, uh, map, uh, cube map lookup stuff with that. Uh, what was a bit annoying is that the normalized clip space is upside down in Vulkan. We fixed that by just emitting uh, invert uh, on the GL position dot Y at the end of every vertex shader in our translator. And I would ask if we can't have an extension for this, because for example, if you have geometry shaders or hull shaders, uh, it gets more difficult to do this right in every case. And uh, we think that those differences are a waste of time. What's good is, though, that the set range is good versus OpenShell. It's from 0 to 1, so that matches the other platforms, and it's also better for precision. For pipelines and states, we had a similar problem than the uh, speaker before. We have also an old-style API, so we have to emulate that uh, by doing state tracking. And then at trot time, we use hash tables to look up pipelines, render passes, and frame buffer states. But this actually was. Uh, really small overhead, I was surprised. This works really well, it's barely noticeable in the profiler. And we use dynamic states for sys of viewport stencil and depth bias, so this reduces uh, the hash map key size quite a bit. And the total game, everything, single player, multiplayer, and snap map is only 350 total graphics pipelines that I could find, so that's really good. Um, we had also the same issue that uh, pipeline creation is really expensive at runtime. Some of our pipelines take over 100 milliseconds to compile, so the player would get hitches. So we basically did exactly the same solution than Epic. We went through the game, also serialized uh, the pipelines we need to disk, and at game launch we then read this pipeline fi uh, file and uh, launch shops to generate and fill the hash table that we're using for the pipelines. And this is fairly robust because if you have missed any pipeline, it will just uh, create them in hitch in this case, but this doesn't happen for us anymore. For the script sets, we also got lucky a bit because our engine currently doesn't do any geometry streaming and our textures are virtualized, so we're not actually creating new textures. All our texture streaming is going through the virtual texture system, which is using the same set of textures. So even for the descriptors, we got away with just a big 
descriptor has hash table, and we just bind one large descriptor set to each of our PSOs for each combination that we need. And if anything ever gets deleted, we just flush the entire thing, which is at level unload, for example. And we only see about like 4,000 descriptors per level if you play through it. Uh, for dynamic uniforms, we use a ring buffer like we do on the consoles. And uh, we do thread safe allocation with atomics. You just need to be, uh, make sure on Vulkan that you actually 256 byte align everything because NVIDIA actually requires this, otherwise you get garbage. And uh, this is also the maximum uh, that the uh, spec allows as a, an alignment. So if you just hard code it to an 256 byte, you're gonna be fine forever. Um, so those then get bound with uh, uniform buffer dynamic uh, descriptor, which allows you to uh, specify the offset in the VK command bind descriptor sets uh, parameters. We also had to use this for skinning data because we need to uh, generate um, dynamic bones. And there the range was problematic because the range for the skinning while, uh, varies wildly. So because the range is baked into the descriptor set, this would have exploded our hash table size. So we just hard coded it to 64 kilobyte. This is in theory, uh, or it is a violation of the spec in this case, but we're never actually reading outside of the buffer range, so we got away with it. The alternative would probably to just dynamically create more descriptor sets. Uh, for multi-threading, this was mostly a straightforward port from the consoles. Uh, the only problem we had was the image layouts. Uh, we used just a double buffered CB for our, one of our contexts, and we used uh, read-write logs for the hash tables. <coughs> so if you're not creating new objects into the hash tables, it's never doing any mutex or anything, so we don't have any contention of the workers. And this is the result of this. As you can see, we have a GPU limited frame here. The first four blocks are the CPU, so I'm showing four of eight cores here, and as you can see, they're basically 100% busy while they were filling command buffers. So we're very happy with this result. For image layouts and barriers, our engine actually has quite a lot of them, because we do a lot of um, post-processing and stuff. We have like 25 barriers a frame, and each of those barrier calls actually does a lot of image transitions, so it's hundreds of image transitions per frame. So it was very important to combine multiple barriers into one call so the driver can correctly optimize this and doesn't do multiple flushes. Uh, what was also tricky is knowing the last image state. You can't just hard code this in the code because the last image state depends on what options were set, what passes were running before, so we actually only specify the next image state uh, and the previous image state gets tracked by our system. But again, parallelism makes this really difficult because the same image might be used in different contexts and they are filled parallel. So as a compromise, we only do automatic tracking inside one of our contexts. And the good thing about this is that not many images actually are used in different contexts. So as a solution there, at the start of the frame, only for the images where we know this is going to be a problem, we actually patch the image state for some of the contexts, so we fix this wrong tracking up. And at the end of the frame, I'm going over all the transitions in the frame and determine for each image what is the actual state at the end of the frame, and then set this as the initial state for all the contexts at the beginning of the next frame. And uh, we're also not using any split barriers right now, even if that might allow more um, GPU overlap, but that would have made it even more complex. So to explain this a bit, um, let's say we use the same image in context one and in context two. In context one, this, uh, the last frame state is share the read, and then that does a barrier to attachment right, and then in context two, we go from attachment right again to share the read. So in this case, we have to patch this initial state in context two to attachment right, otherwise from the last frame it would still have been shared or read, which would be wrong because context one on the chip you actually put it into attachment right. Um, for memory, we just use a simple block allocator. We split into 128 megabyte pieces, and uh, the allocator, if the GPU trial returns, we can't allocate anymore. First tries smaller allocation until it succeeds it succeeds or it falls back to system memory if we can't fit anything. 
And for resizable images, we allocate them individually because otherwise you would get into trouble with um, fragmentation and stuff. So this was also good for NVIDIA because they're actually quite problematic right now under uh, memory pressure, especially on two gigabyte cars, although this was fixed in the driver partially by now. So what really helps there is to use NV dedicated allocation that allows them to swap stuff uh, out of the, um, of the VRAM, even though it's a Vulkan allocation that is on the device. Um, for the uploads, we upload everything through a common staging manager, and we have a double buffered staging area, and each of those staging areas is associated with a command buffer which holds the copy commands and uh, has a fence, and then if the buffer gets full, we write the fence at the end of the CB and submit it, and before we reuse it, we wait on this fence. Uh, what's also important with memory is, is that you flush the host visible uh, ranges that you have mapped before your graphics submits, otherwise you could get into cache issues. For synchronization, we double buffer everything, which minimizes the latency, so after every GPU frame, we just sync it on the CPU again. This, again, minimizes latency. Uh, for this, to debug, actually, GPU view is really useful, so much more useful than OpenShell and DirectX. I'm going to do another slide on this. And uh, synchronization swap chains are really tricky. Make sure that you always acquire and present uh, that this is always matching, otherwise you get into really weird issues. And what we also figured is that the acquire call needs to be as late as possible on the CPU frame. So we do this uh, right before submit, before we create the command buffer for the final upsample. So as an example for GPU view, you can clearly see um, the correspondence between uh, a Vulkan semaphore and uh, a semaphore in GPU view. So you can see the weights, the signals, you can see the present tokens, you can see the different queues on the CPU and the graphics card and what your CPU cores are doing. You can see the API calls, etc. So I, I recommend to use this to debug your stuff and figure out if something isn't working. Uh, for asynchronous compute, uh, it's very useful for us to leverage wasted GPU idle time, for example, during shadow and depth pass. The ALUs aren't really doing anything, so we use this for GPU particles and post-process. Our post-process completely overlaps with the beginning of the next frame, and then we can actually do a present from a compute queue on AMD, which minimizes the latency. And uh, on NVIDIA, they are still working on uh, driver support for this, but uh, we, we are not sure if we can do the present from the compute queue on their hardware, so what you would need to do there is do a sync point on the graphics queue, wait for the async compute, and then present from there, which might add a li little bit more of latency. And currently, we're using uh, sharing mode concurrent for the render targets that we use in the async and on the graphics queue, um, but you should be careful with this because on some uh, graphics cards this might disable some compression stuff. So it might be better to use sharing mode exclusive, but then you need to transfer the images between the queues with barriers. So it's adding a bit, little bit more of complexity. Uh, for the results, we're very pleased with the performance gains. In some scenes I actually see 60 to 70 percent more performance in GPU limit. This is not CPU limit gains. And it's even faster on AMD uh, without uh, any of our special stuff that we added on AMD, like async and intrinsics. It's like 30% faster already than OpenGL. Uh, on NVIDIA, the GPU time in the end was about the same. Um, the render CPU limit is mostly gone, like some people were reporting, they're running the game on a one gigahertz CPU with uh, four cores and it's running fine at over 60 hertz. So this is lots of potential versus OpenShell. Uh, for the future, we want to do the prepare image barriers and layouts at the beginning of the frame, resolve this uh, already so we don't have to do this uh, ugly tracking. We want to remove the hashes and uh, move all the awareness of the PSOs and the baked states up to the high level code and know exactly what pipelines are used in the game without having to play the game or do let, uh, let QA do that. So, 
this would help us um, not having to do uh, the serialization stuff. Also, uh, we want to use uh, render passes. Subpasses, even on PC hardware, can benefit the driver because it can do more optimizations. And uh, we want to use split barriers. We can command set event, wait events, because in some cases this actually uh, allows more overlap on this uh, GPU, so you can get some performance there. We also want to reuse command buffers, like our deferred passes and the post process is doing exactly the same each frame if you don't change settings, so we could just uh, record a command buffer once and replay it. We want to use more asynchronous compute, of course. It's, it's a big win. And we also want to use asynchronous transfers. Right now we just do a synchronous transfer, so it's running on the graphics queue, which uh, introduces some slight GPU bubbles. But those, right now, we can overlap with async, so it's not too bad. But in the future, we also want to use asynchronous transfers. So I want to thank Jean Geoffroy, which helped me a lot with this port. He did a lot of the async work. Tiago and Billy for handling a lot of other stuff with Vulkan as well, fixing shaders, etc. Also the whole team at its software. I want to specifically thank Baldo Carlson for doing RenderDoc. It's awesome. And uh, of course the AMD and NVIDIA guys for helping us with this. And I want to say that you should make sure to play the game because it's really awesome. <laughs> um, and also we are hiring, so if you want to work on some real Vulkan code, make sure you visit jobs.cinemax.com. Thank you. Right. GPU View is uh, produced by whom? I don't know it. Uh, it's actually a Microsoft tool. Okay. It's very hidden in the SDK. The UI is mm. really weird, but it actually directly connects to the kernel or something. So you, it, no matter what API you use mm. or what's running on the system, you actually see exactly what's going on in WDDM. So it's really useful. Awesome. Thanks. You're welcome.